Coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. And then we come in and the tech guys, you know, that are the company are passive aggressive. And it takes uh, a lot of time to, to build up trust and say that we're not here to, yeah, to replace you. Everyone's objective, every consultant's objective should be to bring in skills that are missing on the client side while capitalizing on the, on the skills and the knowledge that the client has better than anyone else in the world. All right, let's talk building an IoT product or system. Time to cycle through concept to ideation, to proof of concept, to prototype, to minimally viable product, and then to end product. In this episode of the IoT Business Show, part two of two, I speak with Yuri Priadko, who shares his experiences in the six-step journey to manufacturing or deployment. In part two, we get into plenty of details and numbers using a fun, but useful product example, this time in the consumer IoT space. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people, the business, and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is made possible by sales of my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, and the IoT Inc. Certified IoT Professional, or ICIP, online training and certification program. Become a certified IoT professional by completing the program's three courses, ICIP Technology, ICIP Business, and ICIP Strategy and Digital Transformation. Details of which can be found at www.iot-inc.com. That's www.iot-inc.com. With me today on episode 38 is Yuri Priatko. Yuri is Director of Customer Solutions at Cognience with experience spanning product and process design, hardware and software development. Prior to his current position, Yuri led the project management office, tailoring industry standard approaches to customer needs. This is part two of our two-part interview. Uh, Welcome back. Thanks, Bruce. It's good to be back. All right. So let's um, let's just take it from where we left off. Okay. Let's quantify the cost now a little bit, both in terms of money and time. Um, You don't have to give us for this particular project unless you want to, but typical projects, I think it'll help our listeners to get their arms around this. And I've been asking this to all the guests when we've been speaking on this issue, but what are we looking at from a a typical budget to get from this ideation or conceptual stage to production? So just take us through the pre, to take through the pre-production. What has been your experience um, from a cost point of view? And then the next thing I'm going to ask you is from a time point of view. Okay. Uh, uh, of course, I, I, I'm very tempted to say it depends. Uh, but of course, but, but, of course. Dip- but you're not, I, but you won't, I, I, you won't let me, <laughs> <laughs> I won't let you No, I want to, I want to hear some numbers. Yeah. I will give you some numbers. So for, uh, for the design phase for this initial workshop and prototypes, uh, you're looking at, uh, uh, about 75 K and up. Okay, uh, that makes sense. Uh, and for for the development, uh, it can be uh, anywhere uh, from from the couple of hundred thousands uh, to to millions. It depends on the complexity of the hardware design, but also heavily depends on the software. And the software, uh, I uh, when I was talking about the costs of you know personal trainer versus uh, amortized cost of the R and D, the uh, the beauty of uh, of having uh, of switching more of the solution to to the software part is. Because it scales so well. Sure, sure. You know, sure. your incremental cost of of having one more uh, user sign up for the uh, you know for the membership for the NetPulse enabled membership is zero. Right, right. No, no. And thank you for those numbers, Yuri. I mean, that's helpful for everybody. And and just to put a finer point on it, when you say design, so you know, generally what we're going to want to get to is a proof of concept to then you know make decisions whether we're going to move forward to our prototype or our pilot, depending on the on the circumstance of the project. Mm-hmm. Is that is that when you say design, is that taking us to any sort of proof of concept, or is that all on paper? Is there anything we can actually see and hold? Um, or maybe another way to put it is. 
what is the typical pricing to get to a proof of concept stage or, or is that the design? Uh, usually the design phase will involve uh, proof of concepts. Again, it depends okay. on, uh, it heavily depends on the complexity of the product. Yes, if you, yeah, absolutely. If you can prototype on a breadboard, uh, totally yes. If, if you need uh, some custom hardware development, mm. then mm. Uh, it's probably going to be extra. Uh, so right, right. Uh, at the end of the uh, design phase, uh, after after you've done all the insights extraction, all the problem finding uh, part, you know, and problem solving part, both si- uh, sides of the so- cycle, you will end up with the prototypes. And for example, they they can be uh, they they can be. Of course, they will not be production ready. For example, no, to give you an example, no. if we're talking about creating a device, you know, a, a physical yeah. Uh, yeah, a thing, a physical yeah. thing, uh, yeah, yeah, a product, right? sure, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. As the result of the prototype phase, you can end up with the three D printed uh, uh, case for the device, so that we can test okay. the ergonomics of it. And uh, on the side, there will be a breadboard prototype that will not fit yeah. into that case, but Absolutely. that will uh, enable you to to test the functionality and the schematics, and maybe uh, load up uh, some uh, uh, some embedded code into it and uh, and see see how it works, how it you know, blinks the, uh, the LEDs. Yeah, no, no, that makes sense. And yeah, whether you're using a breadboard or an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi, I mean, mm-hmm. again, you just want to get some sort of computational going in a low cost without having to get into FPGAs or, or, you know, anything more complicated like that. But okay, no, that, that sounds about right. I mean, 75K, and I think you're actually throwing in a 3D printed case. That's awesome. That's a pretty good deal, I'd say. But that's been about my experience too, is, is around between 50 and 100K to have anything of reason, you know, a reasonable, a reasonable type of uh, proof of concept. Uh, um, not, not the 3D printed case, a 3D printed physical prototype that, yes, that you, that's will, what I meant. That's that you right. will be able of course, to, yeah. uh, to, <laughs> to then manufacture, then get the molds made and then spend all no. that money for the molds and all that. It, yes. it, it, in, in fact, it has to, it, it has very little to do with the molds since the, oh. uh, the 3d model, the CAD model that you need to uh, create mm. uh, for, for example, for, for, for injection molding uh, is, okay. is very different and it should be designed differently uh, from the step uh, files that, that you would use for 3d printing. In our experience, we just have to recreate the model from right. scratch based on the yes. uh yes. you know based on the results of user testing but that 3d printed prototype can be used for ergonomics testing on on actual live people and getting feedback you know is it comfortable to hold in the hand do you see yourself uh, you know using this thing in you know on the street in a public place will it be you know w- w- wouldn't you look weird would, would you look from you know from star trek we had uh we had this very interesting. <laughs> what you look like from Star Trek? Yeah, yeah uh, we had this uh, very interesting project project where we were working on uh, breathalyzer, smartphone connected breathalyzer, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, we uh, we actually had uh, a lot of iterations on the hardware design uh, together with the manufacturing partners uh, of 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 uh, the company was called Alkahoot. So together with the manufacturing partners with, of Alkahoot in China, we had uh, a lot of uh, iterations on. On how it would connect to the smartphone simply because we didn't like the the ergonomics and it was mm-hmm. uh, it was a couple of months process just to get the connection right it was connecting not via bluetooth it was connecting via smartphone jack in order to uh uh to actually uh reduce the interoperability uh, problems and to drive the cost down right no no that makes sense and i think and i think what you you brought up earlier is an important point and you know the 3D prototypes when you're when you're doing 3D printing the the modeling is very different, um, but then and it certainly doesn't include the CAD work that's going to be taken to actually build the real the real product or manufacture the real product. Nor will it include the cost for the molds to in, you know the injection molds to to create. Them. No, absolutely, that can run you uh, into the molds themselves can run you into uh, tens of thousands uh, easily. Yeah, no, easily. I mean, just with my my previous company when I. When I was, you know, actually in, as a CEO of the company, we built some molds for just these small dongles. We call them dongles, but they were little devices, networking devices, and they were about twenty-five thousand dollars. Now that was about seven years ago, but I'm sure it hasn't changed that much. It, it hasn't. It's the same order of magnitude now, uh, maybe yeah. marginally higher. But uh, today we have uh, for for this small uh, small volume production, uh, 
you th there are actually 3d printers that can uh produce uh production grade quality that that can be put out there in the field and if we're looking at uh you know a very limited run if we need you know 10 devices yep. Yep. uh it 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 might be uh, a sensible solution as opposed to injection molding Absolutely. No, absolutely. All right, let's talk about time now. Um, so on the same, you know, let's say for the same type of projects where you've given us a cost in terms of money, what about time? What are we what are we looking at? And I know it does depend, it really does, depends on, you know, specifically if you're working with that startup that we talked about, or you're working with that that innovation lab. But um, what are you seeing, if you squint your eyes, just roughly, what should people be thinking about? Uh, for the discovery, for the uh, first phase, it will be a couple of weeks to a couple of months. Uh, okay. I, I think uh, it you, 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 shouldn't, you shouldn't really go uh, beyond two to three months max, otherwise you're, you're, you're not focusing enough. You're not doing the and, right thing. And discovery, by definition, at the end of discovery, what are you getting? Uh, at the end of the discovery, you will get uh, the, uh, the, uh, the prototypes, the, okay. uh, and you will get the specifications uh, for that, that you can run with and actually prepare for, uh, for the manufacturing as well as for uh, any software development that, uh, that you may need. Wow. So you're saying, I mean, this is a lot faster than, than, than uh, my experience. So you're saying you're going to be able to get your customers to prototype, to the prototype phase within two to three months? Uh, uh, or am I understanding that correctly? Uh, uh, it, it really depends on the definition of prototype. Uh, okay. We what what we what we'll, ha we'll have at the end of uh, that two to three something we can show something we show customers and clients potential customers potential clients so we start getting feedback you know something they can actually hold yes. they can maybe punch around play around a bit with yes yes two to three mo three months is is a, uh, is a good estimate uh, and we we are very much used to moving fast and faster than than you would expect from uh, you know from the traditional. Uh, big, you know, manufacturers or companies. Uh, a lot of our clients actually turn to us because they like this agility, uh, the way to to prototype, fail fast, uh, and uh, and learn on the mistakes uh, on a matter of months, not not years. And um, so, if I just you're just so I understand again your framework or your or your definitions. We are starting from a concept, we're doing a bit of ideation, then we're going to prototype, then we're going to proof of concept, then we're going to production. Is that, is that where a prototype fits in or, yeah. or do you have a different way of looking yeah, at that's, it? Yeah, that's largely correct. Uh, okay. The only thing is when you go into, into the implementation phase uh, where mm -hmm. you turn that prototype into the actual product, uh, like a proof of uh, okay, uh, sorry, like a product. Yeah, yeah okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you will. Uh, so f first, first you have a prototype, then you would have an MVP, and then you will have uh, the, right. the the market product. So okay. uh, the, uh, the this two two to three months is not for the MVP. This is for the prototype. This is for something you can show to customers, but this is probably not something you can do uh, a, a large scale A B testing on. Okay. Okay. Good. Now that and then that then that fits more in my thinking. And then what about to the MVP? Because you're right. That is the that would be the last uh, milestone before getting into production. Then what what about timing to get to MVP? Uh, so this this is actually uh, a ver very uh, very tough question since uh, a lot of people have different definitions for for what the MVP <laughs> is. Okay. Uh, I, I've seen uh, more than once and more than twice where people say, "Okay, this is going to be MVP that uh, that we're gonna put in production and use for the first year or two, right. and then we'll figure out if we need to add something." This is not an MVP. Okay. MVP okay. is something uh, that you cannot subtract from, not something you cannot add anything else to. <laughs> okay, okay. So clarify that. What do you mean by that? Uh, I mean that, that the MVP stands for minimum viable product. Right. And uh, minimum means exactly that. You need to uh, descope everything that is not absolutely critical and crucial uh, right. to, uh, to the experience that you want to create uh, for, for your users. Okay. And you were implying, though, that some folks are... are 
<laughs> well, they're saying they, it's ready before you think it's ready, or or it's taking longer. No, they they they, I, I, they say that oh, let's do the MVP, and then they yeah. keep throwing additional features uh, into it. the MVP, so it becomes bloated right, and, right. By de- yeah. and never gets. But the, by definition, it's not an MVP. Then is what you're, is and, what you're and, saying. And, yeah. and and a lot of people think that's that's what the MVP is. And I, I'm, what, what the, the point I'm trying to make is uh, when when the the, the first uh, the first release the first version of the product shouldn't have anything but your core functionality your core differentiating factor. To right. to, to give you an example of of an alcohol, uh, back to that breathalyzer. Mm-hmm. The MVP mm-hmm. was making sure that you can uh, communicate with the device, you can read the data, you can display the blood alcohol content, right? That was an right. MVP. Right. That is something right. that you can uh, run with, you can show to users, you can show to investors, say, you know, we, we got this, right? The, the completed mm-hmm. product, though, in addition to that functionality and the refined mm-hmm. UX, it had two other features that, we, that the MVP didn't have that had nothing to do with the core functionality, but that was integral for the user experience we wanted to create. In addition... But, you're, but are you saying then that you, that you did not produce what the MVP was? You actually went beyond the MVP before getting into production? Uh, yes, yes. So we, okay. we, we okay. actually uh, we, we went beyond the MVP before doing the, the final production run. And, and okay. the, the, the two features that we had, and uh, that, that, that was, uh, that was uh, the, the hardware was pretty much done on the MVP stage, right? But on the software side, we decided that uh, we, 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 we want two more features in addition to displaying your blood alcohol content. Your alcohol, yes. if you get one, will also, in addition to showing you how drunk you are, if you mm. want to continue the mm. night, it will also have a map that shows nearby bars. <laughs> and if you think that you've had enough... I did not think you are going that direction, but okay, keep going. If, <laughs> if you think you had enough, it will allow okay. you to call a taxi. Okay, okay. <laughs> I like that. It's for the party animals. Yeah, I measured it. Yeah, it's high, but so what? i got to keep going. I'm not driving, right? I'm not driving. That's, dr- no, that, that's exactly the point. <laughs> if I'm not driving... I'm beyond the... I'm the minimal... I'm past the minimal alcohol level or, or value level for driving so i'm 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 continuing on so what's where's the next bar i like that <laughs> that's exactly the experience we wanted to create and it became the perfect friday night uh, gadget <laughs> it's a party breathalyzer it's, I like. it's it's a party breathalyzer and by law we are not allowed to legally say that here you are good to drive here you are not good to drive uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, and, but you can say, by law, you are allowed to say the next bar is just around the corner. Absolutely. <laughs> so by law, we are allowed to say your, you know, your blood alcohol content is more more than zero. So why don't you check out the next bar? Just keep on going. Keep on yeah, going. Keep, keep, uh, yeah. Keep so that is not an MVP. No, that's not an MVP. Okay. And so for syntax, I just want to be clear: is there anything between MVP and production? Is that P, or or do you call it anything different? Because you know, just to be just to be clear, is it is it the you go from MVP? What was it? What do you what would you abstractly call the MVP plus the two features that you created? Is that the product? That's the product. That's the the, the product. end product. Okay. Yes, the end product, and then you go into production from there. Is mm-hmm. is, is kind of yeah. What you're that's that's a yeah. oh, that's a correct succession. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Okay. So timing wise, um, we're saying then around two to three months to get to the to the prototype and geez and now i'm trying to remember if you told me did you did you say how long typically to get the mvp i i, I don't remember now oh uh, i didn't uh because i was okay. giving you the <laughs> example of how different mvp can be for different people right right okay that's right. Uh, okay but, so, uh, it, so it, it, it can be uh, y- usually we uh we want this to be done in a couple of months Again, okay, if, if so you're working for, for two years on the MVP, chances are you're not doing things right. Chances are you're working not on the MVP, but you're trying to skip the step and jump re- straight to, to the end product, which is not a good way to do it. Since Absolutely you, not. The, you, you do not have any way of knowing what your users will like, except for Absolutely. asking those users. And getting, no, and getting I, something in their hands as soon as possible is the only way to get that feedback. You don't want to do the production run and then figure out that, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it, it looks ugly. It's not convenient to hold. It's not appealing to uh, 
uh, to your, uh, mm, you know, to your target audience, or the data that you're getting from the sensor are uh, of the uh, resolution that is too low for the task that you're trying to accomplish, right? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, and I, and I think this is something you know that I promote and actually that I've been doing. I kind of move into in from a developer to a product manager is the concept of design, sell, build, as opposed to design, build, sell. And what you're saying, I think, is very important, and you and you are you're being very clear on this. And just to to reiterate, each of these steps, and the reason I'm I'm kind of getting stuck on the syntax is because each of these steps are a definable point in time when you need to go to the customer. You need to at each of them, and I'm and so with my clients, I go to the customer even before because I'm usually involved before the before you would be involved because we're planning on the business then we're doing the the requirements on the information mm-hmm. on the app and then on the analytics and then we get to you know some help but we at each one of these definable steps we should be going to the customer even to the point in my view before you even built anything and just slide where where you're just talking about what it is because I'll tell you and you've alluded to this every IoT project that I've been working on or that I've ever worked on has changed and not even a little bit. This either changed somewhere between 90 degrees and 180 degrees. So, and it's always been the result of, of talking to customers. I mean, how does your experience bear out something similar? Uh, very well said. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't have said it better. It's, it's talking to customer on every stage, uh, every stage. And especially with IOT. And I think, I think just in general, that's, that's just what, that's just the way to do it. However, and um, however, with IoT specifically, conceptually, it's a very different beast. It's a very new beast for for most people. Mm-hmm. And in front of them, early as possible, um, is the most important. Definitely, is the most important thing. Okay, so now we've got the timing, and then um, so another couple of months to get us to the MVP, and then to get us to the P. What are we talking? Another couple of months after that. Uh, it can be uh, from a couple of months to. To a couple of years, we had projects to get to P. Uh, okay, yeah, we had projects before you get to production. Uh, we okay. had projects mm-hmm. that that took, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of many years, literally, uh, oh, to to wow. get to P. Uh, you know, it 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 can go. You know, it it can get pretty big. All right. So why don't you share some of you know some of this experience, some of this wisdom on what to do to not be beyond a couple of months there and not be a couple of years so what have you seen why did it why did it go that long and what can you you know share with our our listeners to help them not be in that same situation so that specific project uh, was uh, it, it was not a pro, uh, you know it was not an over over time over budget situation it was a mm-hmm. deliberately very large uh deployment okay. Okay. Uh, of uh, of a uh, mm, uh, of a smart home gateway that uh, that a large okay. telecom provider in Europe would put in every home of every customer. Got it. And uh, they uh, they just had a lot of uh, work to do on the licensing, a lot to do uh, on the actual hardware design. I remember how we struggled with the with the antenna and the interference because we we were cramming so much into into a very small uh, enclosure. We wanted to make sure it's sleek and it's not. You know, not mm-hmm. a huge box, not obtrusive, uh, and it was uh, uh, it was a project with a number of external dependencies. External dependencies okay. uh, is sometimes what 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 can uh, what can kill you. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a smaller example, not not mm-hmm. not as large, but still uh, the dependency that have cost uh, a friend of mine about a month worth of time, but they mm-hmm. they didn't have that month really, so it was a setback for them. Uh, they they were doing uh, 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 smart home automation uh, product for the blinds for the window blinds to control them right right and and they were sourcing a motor and they found one and they built a prototype with that motor and it was all great until they ordered a bunch of them to to put into into the next run of uh, you know of the uh, of the prototypes that they will distribute uh, to to the uh, initial testers and then it turned out that every single motor sounded differently one was another one (laughs) Uh, it's it it doesn't sound like much but no i can i I think i agree with you though they they have to sound the same yeah you you have to deliver the consistent experience to your users your quality standards have to be higher than everyone else's you're working with only in that way you will be able to deliver 
the great uh, end user experience. Right. No, I agree with you. Okay. So, so external dependencies. All right. I thought, I thought there might've been some trace that you've seen. So this wasn't like an overrun kind of situation, no, no. but what you are saying is external dependencies in that particular case, but generally then, you know, minus, minus the, the outlying, you know, the corner cases, we're talking about another few months after the, um, after the MVP to get to the P. Yeah. yeah uh, I'd say, uh, another, uh, if if we're talking startups, if we're talking you know uh, companies that come to the market with the with a new product uh, mm. and they don't have that interoperability baggage they have to deal with, uh, mm. I'd say uh, another three to six months. Okay, okay, and then if they do have that baggage, then it's uh, all. I guess all uh, bets are off at that point. You're not really sure because that comes back to some potentially some external depend. Well, they could even be internal dependencies, but there's still dependencies that might be out of their control. Uh, I had some internal dependencies that were much worse to deal with than mm-hmm. than external mm-hmm. dependencies because with an external yeah. provider, you can come in and you know drop an f bomb and you know uh, make it sound right. serious and uh, you know uh, you happen. have some levers. You basically can say, okay, you know, I I will go and find another provider at the end of the day. Whereas where you have uh, an internal department in the large organization that is not cooperating, you don't have any power over them. You cannot fire them. You cannot do anything right. about it. <laughs> right. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, th- so that really, that paints a nice picture. I mean, what we're talking about in terms of, in terms of steps here is starting with a concept, you know, getting the ideation, whether they're working with you or maybe doing that internally, getting to a proof of concept, getting to a prototype getting to the MVP, the, mo- the minimal viable product, and then getting to the P. And as we're saying, and the advice here is each one of these steps, you're going to want to be going out and uh, talking with and uh, And uh, each one of these steps should be as short as possible. As short? Yeah, I agree with that. I sometimes think, I think uh, sometimes uh, my customers freak out uh, when they say, oh, Yuri, we need to do this much work. And they drop me like a year worth of team year worth of uh, project. And I say, Mm. I, I no 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 no. This is not how you do it. You need to let's do two months and then then reconsider. And they they right. look at me like why right. why don't you want my business? I don't want your right. business because in in six months the market might totally change and you may need to do a pivot, you know, in a totally different direction. I don't want to commit yeah. to something that may not be valid uh, down the road. No, and and or like you said. You know, it could be a case where the, the, the dog doesn't eat the dog food and the customer doesn't want it. And you want to make sure that you don't spend too much time before you get before you learn that information. Mm-hmm. Yeah. OK, so so then that's good. So then we're putting some concept 1.0, 1.1, 1. 1. 1.2 potentially. But your advice here, and I think that is it is valuable then if it if these don't don't let these discrete steps be be long, you know, and if they ha- if they're more than a couple months, then you should be putting a point release in there and, again, get to the customer, make sure that things are, are right, and not only the customer, then just gauge the market like what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the point that uh, you uh, put your finger on uh, is very important, which is uh, sometimes customers uh, don't uh, – don't have a very good uh, understanding of of the market situation and of the of the you know product idea, mm. etc. And you said that this is exactly what you're helping your customers uh, to do. That is extremely valuable. The uh, people who come to me, having done the kind of homework that you can help them, you can enable them uh, mm. to do. Uh, that that simplifies. Uh, my job that and that increases the chances of product success, uh, you know, by by a uh, by a significant margin. Yeah, no, and, uh, and that actually was going to be my next question: is what what should companies do up front? And um, and then, well, I guess I agree because I'm doing it. But you know, whether it's myself or it's anyone else or it's done internally, you know, what you're is re, you know referring to and what I referred to earlier is really is start building a business plan. And again, this business plan, just like the product, is going to be iterated every single step along the way. But in this business plan, you need to really start looking at not only what the product's going to be, but also look at what potentially 
the implications of the industry will be, implications of competition will be, implications of operational issues within your company. And all these things all come together to come together in the information requirements, the application requirements, and the analytics requirements. And I think once you've thought all those issues through, you can then go to a company like Yuri's and you say, okay, I've got it, you know, at least I have, it may change, but I've got a very clear understanding of what, what is the information I need, you know, what, what is the information requirements I have, these are the application requirements I have to make sure I get the information I need, and these are the analytics requirements I need to make sure I get the information we need. Now, please help me, you know, help me figure this out because I, I have a knowledge gap or I don't have a skill set that's required to get to the, you know, to actually get to mm-hmm. that point. Knowing what you don't know is, is a great power. It is. And, and, you know, this is something, you know, that other guests have said and I've, you know, and I've tried to implement myself in my dealings is, is just having an honest assessment of what your internal capabilities are, you know, and often that's talked in the, at least it's been on my show, it's been talked in the context of security, but I think you can, you can generalize that and just be honest, you know, and, and the reality is where we are in the evolution of IOT, we need, we need you know, we need companies like yours. We need we need system integrators. We need product design houses just because it's not plug and play yet. And that's just the evolution. At some point, you know, it's going to be easier to, to pull together. But the other point I want to make is that it's not that expensive. If you look at, you know, the overall size of the budget and what has to be done, it's still worth, you know, even if you're, you know, even if you're just bringing, um, you know, bringing in a company to get, 80% of their value for 20% of the budget, you know, using the 80% rule, um, you know, a company like Cognance, it's like, do it. You know, it's, it's well worth, it's well worth that, that uh, cost because doing this upfront work properly is going to make all the, the difference in the world. And if you've known those skills, it's going to go, it's going to go south real quick. And even more so, uh, when you stage the work in a way where you can get a customer feedback after every single iteration, not yes. spend three years on developing and putting the product onto the market just to know right. that no one wants it, uh, right. is, uh, is a great way to, to limit, you know, to, to cap your losses. If, for example, if you do the, uh, the initial trans analysis, if you do the initial, you know, discovery, uh, in, initial mm. uh, insights, and then you realize that your product doesn't make sense in the context of a larger picture, you know, let's, let's play make-believe. Let's say we are doing the, uh, the uh, you know, the product that would connect through your car computer, uh, you know, uh, or, you know, o- o- OBD2 through OBD2 mm-hmm. or in, in any other way, uh, you know, you may be some uh, technician installation, and it would help you uh, with fuel, uh, you know, improving your fuel consumption, right? right? And then you do the trans research, and in our imaginary world, uh, in three years, there will be 95% of electrical cars on the road. <laughs> right. Or, or, or gas prices, as we've seen, are going to be low enough that it doesn't justify the difference in what the savings would be doesn't justify the cost of the product. Right? Yeah. Have, same, same kind of that's concept. That's just rate the interest rate. Which will drive the dollar down. The dollar goes down. Uh, sorry, the, the the oil, the the barrel goes down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know all the dynamics in the world uh, show that this this is going to continue for uh, for some time. Still, I'm I'm not a big believer in hydrocarbons. I I I, I do think that w- that we need cleaner uh, energy and cleaner transportation. Uh, but but right now you're you're absolutely right. Yeah, you know, the cost is, is pretty low. All right, so my other question I have for you is who, who generally approaches you from, a, uh, from the company that is hiring you? Is it, you know, who puts up their hand? And it, are you dealing typically with a technical uh, person, a senior manager, uh, a product manager? Who is it that normally makes that initial contact? Uh, it can be two ways. Uh, it depends on uh, on the gaps analysis, on on on, yep. on the uh, potential customer knowing what they don't know. Uh, okay. Sometimes you have uh, you have a very good understanding of your target market and your consumer as a company, but you you don't really know 
uh, uh, you don't really know how to I- implement the ideas that you have. Right. What 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 is the current technical capabilities? Yes, yes, and I think that's a and that's probably the more typical situation. It is very the, typical, at least that I've seen. It yeah. is very mm-hmm. typical, uh, but but you know sometimes uh, also we get approached by technical people. Uh, who say, okay, folks? Uh, mm. Just just recently, we mm. had this situation who, who, uh, where where people said uh, came to us. They worked with us worked with us before, and they said, well, we 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 could have done this in house, but we know that in this specific field, and mm. very specifically, it was geolocation. We are very strong in uh, mm-hmm. in, okay. in these technologies. Uh, in this specific field, we know that you are, you know, the best game in town. Can you help us? And mm-hmm. they had very specific technical requirements that right. we, we actually uh, helped them uh, refine and revisit. And we did the, uh, our own research. And that research actually made them go back and reconsider the, the product requirements, uh, the, the mm-hmm. business requirements. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, after our technical research, the, uh, the business requirements have changed. So it's, right. it's, it's always a combination of, of the product people and technical people with whom we interact with. Mm-hmm. Uh, so our, I would say, our typical executive sponsor would be v- either VP of product or a CTO. Uh, okay, so then typically on the technical side is what you're saying. Then. Uh, yeah, it, we we get very technical. Uh, we we uh, so the. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who who get uh, who who are very good at at doing stuff. There, you know, there are a lot of uh, outsourcing companies that can uh, use take the blueprint and do exactly what is said there. And there are a lot of companies uh, who are. Uh, great at designing experiences. You can think IDO, uh, mm, right, and mm. IDOs of the world. But uh, w- our, uh, you know, our uh, Cognance was built uh, on the premise that uh, there, there was no one on the market that can offer both under the same roof, both designing the experience and building the experience. Yeah, no, and, and there are different skills, and I think that goes back to the, the gap analysis that you were talking about. Some companies will have one, some companies will have none, some p- companies will have, well, not, I, I not think I hard. would say, I'd say rarely it'd be none. I mean, rarely they'd be both. They'd have both. Um, they're going to need some help. But, um, but yeah, and I think that does come down. But what I was getting at was generally what you're saying, realizing, yeah, you, you're, you're highly technical, I understand, but it is who you, who's making contact with you. So who's making contact with potential customers of people listening to this, you know, to this podcast is generally going to be on the technical side of the house is, is in your experience. That, uh, that's what uh, you're saying. On both on the technical side and on the product side. Okay, so on the product side as yes. well. So you're saying it's kind of like a team approach. They'll approach you as a team. Oh uh, yes, yes. Uh, usually, uh, well, the 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 best collaboration happens when uh, the product side and the technical side are yes. aligned. They're talking. That's a good thing. Yeah, and uh, this this is often not the case. We've seen uh, situations where where the product side would come to us in distress and say, you know, they they don't understand what we want. Help right, us, right. help us, and then we come in, and the uh, the the tech guys that that you know that are the company are passive aggressive, and it takes uh, a lot of time to <laughs> to build up trust and say that we're not here to uh, to replace yeah, to you. replace <laughs> you. We're here to help you. We are here to make help you make your job better. We're here to 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 ensure your job security, not right. you know not replace you. And you know there there is a. Uh, there is a politically incorrect term that I've heard somewhere, uh, but to be Bangalore, which is to to, oh. to be <laughs> laid off uh, because okay. your yeah, your yeah. job was uh, was yeah. outsourced to okay. uh, to Bangalore somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, our our uh, you know our object- objective is the total opposite of that. Our objective is to make sure that we bring in the skills uh, and uh, and. Well, I, I think everyone's objective, every consultant's objective should be to bring in skills that are missing on the client side uh, while capitalizing on the uh, on the skills and the knowledge that the client has uh, better than anyone else in the world. No, and that's right. And, and generally speaking, you know, specifically, you know, when you're going into a particular industry, it's going to be the domain knowledge of that particular industry, the domain knowledge of, of that particular market. And you want to augment it. But, I mean, that, that leads me to my next question. When you're working with these companies, and ideally it will be a team approach both on the product and the technical side, what are the typical skills that are missing? What, is the, what are the gaps that you're finding? And what are you typically 
filling in, I suppose, is maybe another way of asking the same question. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, uh, I actually, I actually think, uh, it, uh, there, 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 there is no, there is no single answer. Uh, okay. There, there is, you know, every, every uh, you, you can say, uh, if, if you're doing, uh, you know, some, something over and over again, if you are an ERP integrator and if you, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you're very good at, at uh, you know, at, for example, uh, automating the business processes of the retail uh, company, mm. right? Mm. Then mm. You, you, did, uh, you did Columbia, uh, then, you, uh, then you go to Old Navy, uh, then you, you know, uh, then you help uh, maybe, you know, some, some, some uh, mm -hmm. you know, with the slight changes. Yeah, I get it. Uh, you will, I mean, you, 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 you do uh, same thing with variations uh, over and over again, and you become better than anyone else in that field. Our experience right. is, uh, is a little bit different and our focus is different. Every time uh, we do something uh, that, that has never been done before. So, well, well, I guess where I'm going with this is if we're looking at it from an IoT perspective in particular, mm -hmm. you know, what is new for a lot of companies that I deal with are, number one, analytics, you know, and number two, model building, you know, and number three, application development. If they're not even in some cases, they're not, you know, they don't have software developers even on on board. If they do, they're very different. So I guess I was leaning more. I was wondering, I, I guess, more on the stuff that's unique, uh, the, the capabilities or the skill sets are, that are unique to IoT analytics. Right. I would presume. I presume yeah. that would be a common denominator with most of your with most of your clients that they they don't have the data scientists or they don't have the skill sets within the organization to be able to get these insights. You know, specifically the ones that you were talking about. Like, for example, how was the insights in terms of um, the performance? You know, capabilities of your example with the fitness club or being able to tell when someone was about to quit. Who was who was doing that? Was that was that in house? Was that a third party data science group? Uh, was it Cognance? What, who was it that you know in that case was was doing uh, that? We we do have uh, in house capabilities to to do that, and it's uh, it's always uh, so for uh, for for uh, for a case like this, we would work uh, with uh, with the uh, company representative for uh, mm -hmm. for the uh, for the industry insights, right? A data scientist. Uh, has to know what to look for, yes. right? Uh, and uh, if 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 they build a model, if they discover a relationship, they they need an industry expert to tell if if this is uh, you know if this is valuable or not. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think they need an industry expert to say if this is valuable or not from a discovery point of view. But I think looking at the other way, at least what you know what I promote is that the company should be identifying the pivot variables should be identifying the components that they that's important for their value proposition to put into that model yes. you know and and then it's a matter of implementing that model in a way that often again i i presume anyway at least that's my experience and i wanted to get it from you but that this this data science or this analytic capability is not something that's in you know that's available that's that that's that's available everywhere or being used today in a lot of organizations uh this this is not a very uh very common skill set, uh, and uh, it's, and it's a necessary it, one, it, right? It, if, it you is, wanna, if you want, if you want to extract the value, it's it's crucial. It is crucial, and uh, uh, so, sometimes, sometimes we uh, we have to uh, when when we are looking for talent. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we we have to look for people who don't think of themselves as data scientists. Sometimes we uh, we we would find someone who has a PhD in applied math or, you know, in, right. in statistics. Uh, and uh, they, they, they never considered that what they do is actually very applicable to, to the IoT uh, mm. the field to, you know, to, to the to gathering, to harnessing this uh, huge amounts of data that now you, you're now able to collect and making sense out of it and doing the, the small digestible nugget of uh, of information, mm -hmm. the model that you will be able then to, uh, to uh, you know, to 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 generate user value out of. Right, right. No, and that's a good point. You know, is is finding these data scientists is is kind of is going to be a step because you know any company that's going to be engaging with a consultant, uh, you know, a company like yours, 
my recommendation is you need to you need to bring in house intellectual property that's that's very important for the product or for the or the system that you're designing or you're building. And one of them is going to be this model development. It's going to be the analytics. It's going to be the software development. And so there has to be, do you, I mean, what do you do? Because at least that would be, if I was hiring you and I was the company, I would say, great, Yuri, you know, you're going to help us develop this. But I, I don't want to have to go to you every single time I want to make a change or I may want to, you know, morph this into something different. So I need to bring these skills and this intellectual property in-house. What do you normally do to kind of um, help that along or to, 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 to help the, the end user or, the, I should say, your client uh, do this? That's, that's a uh, great question. Uh, and it actually uh, overlaps a lot with the initial discussion that we had on, mm. on using the low-level libraries versus, versus using the <laughs> APIs. So uh, a right, system right. that is ve- well-designed allows yes. uh, the uh, non-technical user, non-data scientist, industry expert uh, to, uh, to uh, work with the data and to, uh, to generate, uh, you know, to, to extract those insights and to tweak the ways the models are being built by, based, based on the data without, mm-hmm. uh, you know, without much help from, from the outside. So for, like uh, uh, for, uh, to give you an example of, of another vertical, which is not IoT, but it's very big and it overlaps a lot mm. Uh, mm. With, uh, with the analytics question uh, that we're discussing right now, advertisement, ad tech. Okay. Uh, uh, huge uh, tasks yep. Uh, yep. with regards to measuring the effectiveness of the campaign, uh, reach, yep. uh, uh, all, the, all the metrics, all the, uh, mm-hmm. you know, all the per unit metrics, uh, uh, it's uh, it, it's it's a, you know a lot of data, and you need to. And one of the projects that we were tasked with is to enable a C-suite to hmm. be able to work uh, with that data interactively. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so being able to interface with it in some way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you have this uh, uh, this Hadoop cluster on the back end that sucks this data in and processes it in some way, and and then you need to uh, to anticipate what kind of questions a CEO mm-hmm. would ask in mm-hmm. you know in in preparing for his board meeting, and to give mm-hmm. that data within minutes, not within you know days of trying to. Uh, Call call up uh, a data scientist and asking him, okay, what was the effectiveness of this campaign versus versus that campaign? And it mm, all like uh, it 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 boils down. Uh, it's I'd say uh, I'd say it it's a user interface task first, and the product design yes. task first, and then uh, it's it's a matter of of understanding that that you need to build a solution that that will cover the. Uh, the use cases uh, that that you, that you want to cover, you will never be able to do that. Back to our main theme of today, you will never be able to do that without talking to your customer, without talking to that CEO and asking, okay, when you uh, evaluate the effectiveness of the campaign or the mm. CMO, uh, mm. when you evaluate the effectiveness of the campaign, what do you look what at? What are you looking for? Yeah, yeah. No, I like that. And, and I think that's, that's actually great advice in the sense of, yeah, I mean, Hadoop or, or any other open source um, let's say analytics package, uh, database structure or uh, database analytics package are super powerful. However, you know to access that power, you do need these these people that we've been talking about, these PhDs in statistics or whatever the case may be. I like what you said. So what you're saying is you're developing a layer on top of it, like a user interface layer on top of the analytics that's maybe not a dashboard because you're actually interacting with it, but it's a subset, but it's but it's something that it's an interactive that's dashboard. Non-technical. That's exactly what it is. An interactive dashboard. Okay. Okay. So that's that would be it. But I think that's actually that's a great uh, I would think that's a that's a that's a great best practice and just to consider and another best practice is to uh, uh contrary to a popular belief is mm. to not create choices for your uh, uh I agree. Yeah. end user but to remove choices from your for your end user as a as right. a ceo uh, i want a button that will say uh you know produce me all the stats that i need you know and, right. and nothing that i don't and only those yeah it, exactly exactly uh, and uh, this uh, mm, th- this is something that uh, you know if if uh, if you take Tableau, you can do beautiful data visualizations, but you basically can visualize whatever uh, is there in the data, 
and uh, you you need to, uh, you need to know you need to first do the user research and understand that these data uh, are best suited to be shown on the map and and this 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 has to be a histogram as simple as that on on the very granular low level and then generating insights from that what kind of insights do we want to generate you know we we have to build, you know, a hundred models first, mm -hmm. test them, mm -hmm. see uh, if 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 the results make sense. Then pick five out of that hundred, and then uh, then allow a CEO to view the results of uh, of the modeling for for those five. How will this campaign go for for a different market? You know, it went well for the North America. Uh, if we launch the same thing for for uh, for Eastern Europe or for 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 Western Europe, how would that fare? Can we model that? Right. Answer is we can. But in order to enable those use cases, you need to understand your user uh, very, very closely. Yeah, and that comes back to, you know, what I preach and what I practice, and that is getting the requirements. And before, you know, interfacing with a company like yours, the requirements, again, just to repeat, what are the information requirements that the company needs? What are the application requirements the company needs? And then what we're talking about here are what are the analytics requirements that the company needs? Mm -hmm. And as part of those requirements can be, I need this type of interactive dashboard that will provide this type of information. And I think that's a nice, uh, I think that's a nice way to kind of close things off. Um, so, Yuri, where can people find out more about you and uh, your company? Uh, I think I uh, I did uh, talk a lot about what we do at Cogniens, so I don't need to spend any time on that. You can go to uh, cogniens.com for, for more examples mm -hmm. and for some of the examples that I used today. Uh, myself, personally, I'm, I'm very reachable. Feel free to, uh, to ping me on Twitter. Feel free to email okay. me. Uh, feel free to reach out in any way. And I will be more than happy to, to give advice, uh, to, uh, to consult on, uh, you know, on your, uh, on your IoT product strategy and beyond that. And if, if, if we're not the right partner, and uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes we are not, uh, I, we, we have a vast uh, network of, of partners uh, uh, that, that I, I will be happy to, to introduce you to if, if need be. Great. No, that's a that's a generous uh, offer, and I think uh, if people um, have questions, they should definitely take advantage of it. And I'll put your Twitter handle as well as your company's Twitter handle in the uh, show analysis notes. But that's uh, that's great. No, thank you, Yuri. That was a good uh, a good uh, two part interview. I appreciate it, and we'll be talking soon. Thanks a lot, Bruce. It was a pleasure, and uh, I, uh, I I really enjoyed I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks a lot. Okay, that was another good talk with Yuri Priatko. This podcast goes vertical, deep diving into different topics each week. If you prefer a more horizontal and structured approach to learning IoT business and its orbiting technologies, check out my book IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, or become a certified IoT professional by completing the ICIP training and certification program. For details, just go to www.iot-inc.com. Also go to www.iot-inc.com for an analysis of this episode, links to things that were mentioned during the episode, and very importantly, the episode's PDF transcript. Just search for the name of the episode or the guest. If you're new to this podcast, subscribe. That way you'll get every week's episode delivered straight to your device. Or, if you've been listening for a while, there are three ways you can support the show. You can leave a rating or a review on iTunes. Just go to iot-inc.com slash iTunes. It only takes one click to leave a rating, a little bit longer to leave a review. You can share it on social. I'm on LinkedIn, to a lesser extent, on Twitter. And, of course, you can support the show by buying my book, IoT Inc., or the ICIP Training and Certification Program. That's how I pay the bills. Next week's episode is How to Get an IoT Product Greenlit with Michael Minkovich. I hope you can join me then. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Till next week, may your path to IoT business be a patient one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show. 